Now, Derrida. Foucault was the teacher of Derrida at the ENS. Foucault took Derrida with him to visit the inmates at the mental hospital of St. Anne. Derrida has been somewhat less publicly flamboyant than Foucault, but he is no less of an irrationalist. He's probably a more effective one. He is the child of a Sephardic Jewish family living in Algeria. He was very young, Derrida, when he had the experience of being buried alive. He was locked in a coffin-shaped cedar chest by his sister. He later managed to escape alive, but he was traumatized by the belief that he had died and been brought back from the dead. From this grew his identification with the Isis-Osiris myth, in which Isis, of course, brings Osiris back from the dead. But this also implied for Derrida an obsession with castration, which he told his students had suggested to him the, uh, the title for one of his early books, Disseminations. Derrida's irrationalism was later fueled by the mystical writings of the Kabbalah, very important, and by his devotion to the satanic degenerate Artaud, Artaud of the theater of cruelty, some people may remember. This Artaud was somebody who spent about a decade of his own life in a mental institution. Derrida was jailed in 1981 by the Czechoslovakian communist regime on charges of drug trafficking, but these, tra these charges were never proven. Some of the best one-liners about Derrida come from Foucault during the period when these two were quarreling during the 1970s. Foucault said that Derrida was a terrorist and an obscurantist who deliberately wrote in such a way as to be impossible to understand so he could then lash out at his critics as cretins who were incapable of understanding the profoundness of his thought. The best summary from Foucault, Derrida is the kind of philosopher who gives bullshit a bad name. <laughs> now, we can, we can turn the lights on. We don't need this at the moment. We have one more. Derrida's opaque doctrines are a philosophy of Anglo-American destabilization from the word go. His big publishing breakthroughs came in 1967, and key lectures were delivered at the height of the May 1968 riots that led to the overthrow of General Charles de Gaulle, the best government that France had seen in many ages. Derrida was a leading light of the clique around the magazine Tel Quel, which was one of the theoretical mouthpieces of this rebellion. No, deconstruction. Deconstruction is an attack on the Judeo-Christian Western European civilization. It is an attack that is powered above all by rage. Derrida hates and resents reason and creativity. And these he identifies with the epoch of Christian creationism and infinitism when these appropriate the resources of Greek conceptuality. That is from his book on grammatology. In other words, Derrida hates Plato. He hates apostolic Christianity as exemplified by St. John, St. Paul, St. Augustine, and other patristic writers. He hates the entire edifice of Western civilization based on Christian Platonism. And in this, he follows mentors like Nietzsche, who claim to be Socrates in reverse, or Diogenes, who defined himself as Socrates gone mad. Most of all, Derrida hates the logos. This in the Greek means word or discussion, perhaps ordering, lawfulness, but finally reason. The logos is reason. In Plato's dialogues, the spoken word is the path to refining and improving the logos or reason. Later, Christ came into the world as the word of God. And in another moment of the Christian Trinity, the Holy Spirit is the logos which proceeds from the Son of God and which abides with human beings. Derrida wishes to reject all of this and all of the implications. Derrida says that Western European culture is guilty of logocentrism. The Western cultural paradigm has contained within it the aspiration to be based on reason. This has to be rejected. The Western cultural paradigm also gives priority to speech and to the spoken word. You can compare this to, to other uh, cultures around the world, but this is not the case. Most literature was originally 
designed to be read aloud or, or even sung from Plato's dialogues to Dante to Chaucer to Shakespeare to Schiller. And this is the hated phonocentrism, which Derrida also wants to get rid of. Derrida delves into Plato in an attempt to show that the overtones of the Platonic logos are exclusively paternal and male-dominated. This gives rise to the further charge of phallogocentrism. And of course, soon enough, that turns into phallocentrism in the writings of the menads of feminist literary theory today. Derrida follows his Nazi guru, Heidegger, in concluding that the real problem in the West is that our culture is permeated by what he calls metaphysics. Heidegger had railed against the metaphysics of presence and against metaphysics in general. For Derrida, metaphysics evidently means anything that cannot be boiled down to sense certainty. Derrida seems, sees metaphysics as the enemy that must be destroyed. And under this heading, he lumps God, the self, the soul, the human individual, causality, substance, essence, idea, action, and virtually any concept of any importance turns out to be metaphysical. These have to go, of course, for reasons that are never really uh, explained. And of course, for Derrida, language is this self-contained formal system of signs with no connection to any reality, concept, or thing. Back during the Weimar Republic in the 20s and 30s in Germany, the pro-Nazi Heidegger and others referred to their battle against metaphysics with the name destruction or destruction. And destruction was the first name that Derrida ever gave to his own method. Parallels have been drawn from deconstructionism to Zen and above all to the Sufism of Al-Ghazali, whose destruction is in effect a deconstruction of Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina attempting to play on their supposed self-contradictions. And writers on postmodernism have called attention to this. A dozen years ago, LaRouche authored a new standard American English curriculum for effective US public schools in which he outlined the requirements for a literate language setting out to express the geometric complexity of reality. According to LaRouche, this would include seven grammatical cases, nine tenses, five moods, an active and passive voice, non-reflexive and self-reflexive features, and a vocabulary of 50,000 to 100,000 words, including a very well-developed verb system. This would therefore mean the ability to express at least 1,260 degrees of geometric freedom. But of course, for the radical nominalist paranoid schizophrenic Derrida, language has nothing to do with reality. LaRouche's geometric requirements for literate language were rooted in the efforts of Dante and Petrarca to create languages as the necessary premises for nation building. See Dante's De Vulgari Eloquentia. LaRouche was also in the German tradition of historical philology associated with Wilhelm von Humboldt, Franz Bopp, and the Grimm's. Derrida is a part of the adversary school that grew up in the linguistic school of Geneva. This Geneva school was designed to combat the influence of German historical philology. Derrida sides above all with the linguistics of Ferdinand de Saussure of Geneva, which accomplished a massive deterioration in these language studies by abandoning all idea of historical analysis. For Saussure and Derrida, the word as a sign does not lead to a concept or an object, but it only leads you to other signs. Take, for example, the word cat. Okay, cat as a word leads you to the furry feline, right? But no, according to de Saussure, this word by itself can mean nothing. It only means something because it's different from other words, like bat or rat or hat. It's therefore a negative and relational axiom of de Saussure. For Derrida, the word seems to promise meaning, but its definition always sends us through an endless chain of other words when we look for the definitions. So the promise of meaning is indefinitely postponed, delayed, deferred, according to this nonsense. 
Each word in a text points to a never-ending series of other older texts, the chamber of texts of Derrida. This is Derrida's jargon word of difference, with a big A in the last syllable, which packs difference and delay into the same baggage. Now, for Derrida, the author is dead by definition. He never existed. The human self and the human ego have collapsed into an X marking the spot where they once were. This is the so-called subject position. There is no perception. All that Derrida is willing to talk about is a text, a written text of black on white with punctuation, typefaces, paragraphs, margins, colophons, copyrights, logos, logos, but no logos, and so forth. This is what he calls writing, or l'écriture. And this writing is primary over speech, primary respect to the spoken word, which is another purely arbitrary and absolutely absurd assertion. Everything is a written text in the sense that every thought, utterance, or discourse, watch out when you hear discourse, because that, that's them. Uh, anything, any discourse is simply a story that we tell each other about something that exists, uh, well, something that, that may or may not exist. And the best way for a discourse to be there is as a written text. So as Derrida says, there is nothing outside of the text. Everything is a text. There are no more works of art. All black writing on white paper is a text, be it Shakespeare, the telephone book, Mickey Mouse, the racing form, the US Constitution, the Jupiter Symphony, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, all of those are texts, and every one of them is exactly equivalent to any other. As you can see, what Derrida tries to do is to draw you into a labyrinth of jargon. He's always shifting the jargon, allegedly to keep from falling back into the hated ways of metaphysics. He uses trace, words like trace, sediment, and iteration to show that words evolve and change their meanings as they are used again and again. It's like barnacles on a ship's hull, or the way a coin might be worn when it goes through uh, circulation. For example, if we hear the word crook, who do we think of? Think of maybe recent US presidents, it's a hint. <laughs> Nixon, all right, Nixon. Well, Nixon, I think Nixon is the one. However, if we think of malaise, malaise. Carter, thank you, good. Very, very, very uh, well-educated uh, group. The malaise, right, the Jimmy Carter's malaise. How about prudent? It's, it's, it's clear. So the idea is that each one of these words becomes freighted with a trace, a sediment of something because of the way that they've been used. And this is always there and may not be under control, it's, it's clear enough. These are overtones, connotations, associations. You can think of them as etymologies if you want to. They become the key to Derrida's practice of what he calls dissemination, the scattering of meanings through free play. The point is always to show that writing is, is the product of some kind of a compulsion, some kind of a determinism. It is not free. One example is Derrida's deconstruction of his favorite target, Plato. If we could have the next, uh, the next uh, overhead here. This is the deconstruction of the Phaedrus dialogue in the book Disseminations by, by Derrida. Derrida attempts to show, through a textual analysis of the, of the dialogue, words that, uh, that Plato uses. One is pharmakeia. This is a proper name. It is a nymph who was present when one of her companions was blown off a cliff uh, and died on the rocks below. Then we have the word pharmacon. This can mean either a medicine which gives life or a poison which gives death. Then we have pharmakeus. Plato refers to Socrates as pharmakeus. It has the overtone of a sorcerer or a medicine man, used ironically. Derrida points out that although Plato goes through this series, pharmakeia, pharmakon, pharmakeus, he does not use a closely related word, which is a synonym of the last one, which is pharmakos. 
And pharmakos is the sacrificial victim or scapegoat. This is the person, for example, who would be ceremonially killed in Athens uh, in the event of a plague or some other natural disaster or some disaster of another type. So scapegoat is, of course, what Socrates later became. So Derrida goes through this with the idea of showing you that Plato was also not free. He was compelled. He was controlled by some kinds of subconscious psychological factors. And therefore, the text says what Plato could not have meant. And this is the obvious deconstructionist conclusion. All reading is misreading. The Phaedrus dialogue and any other piece of writing is hopelessly contradictory and completely indecipherable.